everyone. A very good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are joining in. My name is Livlo Golding, and I'm delighted to be here with you as your host for today's Pila Powered Speaker Series, Project Human Nature. Now, today's topic is sustainability as a whole. And this topic really resonated with me as a wellness entrepreneur myself. I create eco-friendly workout products called FitSphere. Now, it's my belief that every industry and every business can and should be sustainable. We're really excited for today because it is season one of many Pila Powered Speaker Series to come, where we open up the necessary dialogue to fuel action by creating sustainability for all. And by all, we mean all humans with nature. Now, we want you to take advantage of this power hour, not just to listen in and learn, but also to connect with each other. So please flood our chat with your comments and questions as the Pila fam will be here to answer what they can. And of course, they will be selecting some answers to ask during my live Q&A with the speakers. All right, so let's get started. First up, we're going to hear from the incredible Shi Bastida. She is a teenager. who will be talking about changing to create change. What we need to do differently if we are going to Hi everyone, I'm so honored to be here today sharing this space. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the history of the climate uh, negotiations as well as of the climate movement and how we can move forward from there. Uh, so first, a little bit of history is how did we actually get to where we are in all these climate negotiations? Uh, how did civil society and governments kind of work together to get to where we are with the IPCC report or the Paris Climate Agreement? Um, so it all really started in 1992 when the United Nations um, said, you know, there is this ecological crisis happening. We have to do something about it. And that's when the UNFCCC was formed, which is uh, the United Nations Framework on Climate Change and they kind of came together in 1992 to talk about the possible solutions to uh, rising greenhouse gases which were creating global warming. Um, but this negotiation didn't really come to um, a solution so they convened again in 1997 to talk about the Kyoto Protocol. Now the Kyoto Protocol was uh, took place in Japan and here is when nations around the world uh, put targets to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. The problem with the Kyoto Protocol, though, was that only developed nations were asked to decrease their emissions. So there were a lot of developing nations that, uh, whose emissions were increasing rapidly um, that were not checked by greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Uh, this was the case with China, for example, which developed really rapidly in the past few decades. So that's why a lot of other countries said it was unfair for them to have to reduce their emissions when countries like China and India were rapidly increasing theirs. Uh, so that's why the Kyoto Protocol failed um, in, in 2012. That's when it ended. It was uh, labeled as half-baked. And after, the, after that, there were... There was a lapse in a lot of climate negotiations and here's where the Millennium De Development Goals come in. So these goals were a set of goals that were only targeting developed nations now. So they were put together in the year 2000 and they were um, the target year was 2015. By then the, the goals were to end poverty and hunger and all of these really, really big abstract goals that are very necessary, but there was not a good framework for them to be achieved, which led to the Millennium Development Goals to not uh, prosper. Also, it is important to note that civil society was not included in the drafting of these goals, which made the goals not have like the intersectionality and dimension that civil society would bring to the table. Um, that brings us to the Sustainable Development Goals, which a lot of you might know about. This is a set of 17 goals that address everything from life on land, life on water, hunger, poverty, um, renewable energy, life in cities. 
it's a list of a lot of co like a very long list of comprehensive goals um, that are kind of the framework for for sustainable development in today's era and those goals have a lot of pluses and minuses one of the pluses is that you know every country in the world agreed to them um, also they are more comprehensive they're more um, civil society was actually incorporated in drafting those goals but their shortcomings are that they are not enforceable so the united nations cannot actually tell a country to follow those goals and they cannot enforce that upon them also they don't have units of measurement which means that you can't really track how we are doing uh, in these goals it's very abstract um, but at the same time, during all these years, there were these things called COPs, which are Conference of Parties. And this is an annual conference in which countries from around the world meet together to talk about uh, goals on climate. The most notable one, which you might have heard of, is COP21, which is where the Paris Agreement was negotiated. The Paris Agreement was a landmark climate negotiation in which all nations of the world signed and pledged to keep global um, heat to 1.5 degrees of warming uh, above pre-industrial levels. Um, the target is actually 2 degrees, but they really want to do a 1.5 target. And this was a historic landmark goal, I mean landmark uh, treaty, because all nations of the world agreed um, to be part of this transformative transformative framework and what happened after that after everybody kind of breathed a sigh of relief because finally all nations had come together um, was that the IPCC report came out the IPCC report is this very very long report by a lot of scientists that basically say if we want to meet our Paris Agreement goals we need to half our carbon emissions by 50% by 2050 now this is more ambitious than anything that has ever been proposed before in terms of reducing carbon emissions. Um, and that made a lot of countries be more skeptical, uh, including the United States, the United States, which withdrew from uh, the Paris Agreement um, last year. And that's something that for climate activists like me who live in the US, you know, it's a little baffling that that happened, but we're still uh, pushing forward uh, climate action in our own cities and states. Um, so what happened with the uh, IPCC report and the Paris Agreement and all of these negotiations that kind of were coming together was that there was a surge in civil society um, you know, support for all of these frameworks, that support that had never been seen before. And this can be seen probably, you know, about the youth climate movement and how it really exploded over the past two years. And that was really uh, out of the IPCC report, which said we have 10 years to have our carbon emissions. And that is something that, as you know, kids who will be, I, I'm going to be 28 in 10 years, that's half of half of my youth, basically. Um, that could, that is going to be spent fighting for having our carbon emissions. And I know if I don't do that, my future generations are going to be uh, suffering the repercussions. And that is why the climate crisis is a generational injustice at the end of the day. Um, and as of now, scientifically, we have 412 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere which basically means there's a lot, a lot of carbon up there. And we need to get that number down to 350 parts per million. Hence the name of the organization, 350, which you might have heard of, which um, aims to get carbon drawn down from the atmosphere. And to do this, there's two things that scientists say we have to do. One is stop emitting carbon, and the other one is to draw down carbon. And a very interesting fact, actually, is that if all the land that we had all the agricultural land that we have was regenerative, which basically means it's nurtured, it draws down carbon uh, because the soil is healthy. If all the land we had was regenerative, 
we would actually draw down all the excess carbon in the atmosphere that we have. So only one solution can have an enormous impact. Uh, which brings me to my next point of where we are right now. So I told you a little bit about the history and now I want to tell you what's happening um, in the present moment. And I, th I think a, a part of the present moment is that the awareness on the climate crisis has really uh, increased, mainly because that we have more severe climate disasters such as wildfires, hurricanes, uh, coral bleaching, all of these things that are impacting communities across the world, uh, rising sea levels. Um, but another thing is that the way in which a lot of groups like the youth have been able to communicate the science to people has made the science more accessible. But even though we have gone through all these lengths to tell you that the climate crisis is already happening, that you know scientists are already saying we have to um, do everything possible uh, to not get to two and three and four and five degrees of warming. Uh, there are still a lot of barriers that prevent us from acting upon, upon our goals. And here is where I want to talk to you about the psychological barriers of acting on climate. And the truth is that it can be really daunting to face a goal that seems so big and abstract. One of the psychological facts is that they told us for all of our lives that the climate crisis was going to happen in a hundred years. Um, so that made us think, oh, we don't have to worry about it right now. Another really real thing is that people are going to be more focused on getting food on the table, more focused on paying their rent, more focused on paying for their studies. And that means that if you ask them to care about the environment, they're going to say, why are you asking that from me when I can't even do, you know, uh, survive and thrive? And that's where the intersectionality of tackling the issue comes in. How do we make people want to be part of this movement because it's their passion, they recognize that it affects their lives? And here's when we have to talk about justice. Here's where we have to talk about uh, how disproportionate the climate crisis is, how it is affecting more communities, some communities more than others, how it affects some uh, generations more than others. Um, and once we recognize the intersectionality of the climate crisis, that's when we can actually move forward. And that's, that's what I want to leave you with today. Um, we have to have the courage to imagine a new future. We have to have the courage to talk to our friends about it, our families about it. And we have to really think about how our agency right now really has an effect on everything that happens. So I encourage to take all the individual actions that you already know about, but also turn them into systemic actions so that we can build a better future together. And we're here live with Shea to answer some of your questions. Hi, Shea. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. No problem at all. Thank you for spending your time. I have a question here from Lauren, who is in our audience today. She wanted to ask, did the sustainable development goals create any real positive change for the climate crisis? Um, I think that's a very good question. And the answer is the sustainable development goals by themselves didn't create as much, as much change as we would have hoped but they are a framework for a lot of companies, a lot of countries to actually implement solutions. So the goals are just words. They're not actually moving anything forward. But for example, the Paris Agreement has to be um, implemented for the sustainable development goals to be achieved. So it's basically a framework that uh, puts everybody on track to have a really intersectional approach to climate solutions. Well, I guess then the question from another in our audience, Danielle, she asks, so then what are some of the things we can do on a personal level that will lead to a greater impact in reducing carbon emissions? Yeah, so on a personal level, um, there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, for example, what you're shopping, um, make sure that you are buying secondhand, make sure that the clothes you're buying don't have microplastics in them because every time we wash clothes with microplastics in them, we end up polluting the ocean. Uh, what you eat, 
you know, we're not saying be vegan 100%, but watch what you eat. You don't need to uh, eat meat three times a day, right? So that's not how we were um, supposed to, to be as humans. And there are other things like switching uh, where your electricity comes from in your home. You have the option of choosing renewable energy. Um, you know, walk, uh, bike. I think these are all things that we've been told forever. Uh, but the, I think the most important thing you can do is actually change your mindset because all these small solutions will actually seem like a lot if, you're, if, you, if your mindset has not changed towards we have to do everything possible to tackle the climate crisis. And when your mindset changes, you actually start approaching more systemic um, solutions. For example, not only try to buy the right thing at the store, but actually email the company and say, why is there so much plastic that you're offering me in the first place? So I think that's the most important thing. How do we actually change our outlook on life so that climate activism is not a hobby or something that you practice when you shop, but actually a way of life, um, a culture? Absolutely. And what I'm hearing is that these little steps will actually contribute to those development goals. So in, in fact, we are contributing in our, in our small ways whether or not we can reach those development goals ourselves, we personally can make small changes in our lives to contribute. Um, another question from Ellen, what is your response to people who say that individual choices we make for the climate, going vegan, et cetera, um, don't matter? Um, I mean, to that, I would say it absolutely does matter because if you think about it, we cannot shame people for the actions that they do choose to take because we don't need a thousand perfect climate activists who are vegan, don't fly, talk about climate on panels all the time. We can't have that. Um, I mean, we, that cannot be our expectation, right? People who skip school every Friday to strike. Yes, I did. Do, I did that for like 30 weeks, but that's not the only thing you can do. Um, I think that what we need is billions of people doing their best. And if, if your bid is to teach about climate, if your bid is to, you know, you know, do amazing photography, to highlight nature, if your bid is to change your lifestyle, that's the best you can do, then that's enough. And then the next step I would say is really try to explore how you can do even more and talk to your friends about it. But it is absolutely necessary that all of us start gradually changing our all our aspects. For sure. So do you believe that it's more effective for people to work for sustainability in their lives or is it better to work as a generation banded together? Mm. I mean, inherently the climate crisis will affect younger generations the most because we are the ones who are going to be, you know, in our, in our 30s or 40s by 2050. And so then it's scarier for us. But at the same time, this invites us uh, to be more, you know, to be more impatient because this is, that's what we do need for this. Not an impatiency of like actual attitude, but trying to get all of the adults who are in positions of power to change, to do their best. Uh, so I think it's a mixture of both. We definitely need to make personal changes in our lives to be more sustainable because that will change companies that will change how consumer habits are are framed um but we definitely need to tackle the climate crisis in an intergenerational way so that older generations feel like they didn't do their bit their whole lives but now they can and it's never too late to start and never too early to start for sure. And that's what I find really inspiring, especially coming from a teenager, that you really need to look forward towards the future um, to, to really tackle this issue. So our last question um, from Baeza, have you influenced people close to you to join the movement, like your family or friends? I know at times our family and friends don't see the importance of being an environmental activist, but how have you influenced them? Well, actually, um, my best friend from high school, we were friends for four, the four years of high school. And we were just friends, right? We did like, we went to the movies, we did this and that. And when the pandemic hit, I decided to start my own organization. 
And he started it with me, like he was one of my co-founders, when I did not know at all that he actually we not cared about the climate crisis. He came uh, with me to the strikes and all of that, but I didn't know he was as invested as when you give people the actual opportunity to be part of the solution. So I think that said, you know, how do you give people the opportunity around you to, you know, step up and make their own choices uh, for the better? That's wonderful. That's our time for questions today. Thank you again, Xi, for joining us. And I want to remind everyone here that one thing you are already doing by just being here is supporting organizations that are doing amazing work for our world. Now, for every live viewer in our attendance today, Pila is donating $5 to charities nominated by myself and the speakers. So please enjoy these short messages from our sustainable brand partners, as well as a sneak peek at Pila Land, which is dropping tomorrow. People always ask us, how do we make our phone cases plastic free? Well, let me show you. Welcome to Pila Land, where plastic is a thing of the past. <laughs> this is the orchard. Our slim cases are made from fruit peels. The direct translation of peel in Spanish is pila. Nothing goes to waste. Ooh, looks like it's time to harvest our clear cases for the season. Check it out. Oh, and we have some visitors. Hello, little Gripplies. <laughs> our beautiful shores are home to thousands of turtle cases who migrate here each year to reproduce. Look, there's a mom and her squirt now. Over here is where we catch our honeybee cases. Did you know that bees are vital to a healthy environment and economy? We absolutely cherish these little guys. And lastly, our old Pila products are sent back to us to be composted so new Pila products can grow. Oh no, sounds like our vine watch straps have overgrown in the garden. I need to deal with this. See you later. Guys, she's gone. Clothing is a Bolivian American female run business based in Los Angeles. It is also a Latina sustainable and ethical brand. When I decided to build this business, I wanted to be low production and low waste and be less impact on the environment, given that the fashion industry is the second biggest polluter in the world. This brand is for women of color, for people of color, and allies to feel represented and loved. Wasi is a Quechuan word that means home. So I hope that everybody who comes and shops here feels at home and loved. All right, welcome back. Next up, we have a very special presentation for you from our second speaker, Shade Klacken Joseph. She's a filmmaker and a change maker who spent her time in isolation, like many of us, reconnecting with family and nature. Now, before we talk with her about the importance of going back to the basics and becoming a good ancestor, I want you to enjoy this special viewing of her short film, Home. What is home? There's a proverb that says the family is like the forest. If you are outside, it is dense. If you are inside, you see that each tree has its own position. That's how I've come to understand my family. When I think of home, I think of them. My Jamaican immigrant mother is one of 15 children. She is the last daughter of my grandparents, and I am their 41st grandchild the one and only granddaughter born in the US. A Yankee, as they call me. The concept of home has honestly been something I've had trouble fully understanding. As a first generation Caribbean American, not belonging became an uncomfortable norm. This time of isolation has been a time of healing. 
I'm finding home in reconnecting with my elders, going to the roots of our forest, through my conversations with my mother and two of her sisters. Hello. Hi, hot stuff. <laughs> Hi, honey. I'm a baby. I found my baby. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> when you were living here in America, did you consider New York your no, home? or? No, I wouldn't say no, I wouldn't say good over there. My man wouldn't say good over there. Coming home now. You, you, you see, you're in your own birdland, you know, and you family here. You really have family over there, too. But if family is here, you, you know, you, you, you just feel free. I think I would move back, although you have crime everywhere. But I, I love Jamaica, to be honest, I love Jamaica. My father, love land. People in Jamaica are just crazy about land. Most people inherit their land, especially in the country areas. Most people do farming. I remember I had a time and Scallion Garden. That I remember. Oh yeah, and the Ariel and and the They did more of the, especially on the Ariel, of the farming than what I did. How's your garden doing? It's not good at all this year, not good, it's not good at all. Mm. Things are not coming out properly because you couldn't get the right soil. And I was praying the Lord pray to make the church grow. Oh. <laughs> oh, what is home? The answer seems to lie under the dirt. You see, I come from generations of farmers from Scotland to St. Elizabeth, Jamaica. But growing up in the concrete jungle of New York, this city girl ain't ever even held a shovel in her life. Is there a song Papa would sing when he'd be in the garden? <laughs> Maybe, um... I carry my acre garland, stay the market, not that what he would sell. Carry me acre garland, stay the market, not that what he would sell. It's good night, my darling. I'm going to get some sleep. Poor Indian. Look, no, I came too, too much. You look tired already, please. You got a lot there to plant. Hard work. Never mind. Good for the soul. And I wish you all the luck. Tomorrow I shall see these lovely plants from you. Okay, darling. If you have a house, get it wet a bit, and you get it easier to work on. I'm here for you, morning, noon, and night, about the plants. Don't afraid. Okay, sweetie. Love you. You're looking good, just like the plants. It suits you too. You look so great and like you. you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what is home? It's right here, in me and these women's shared laughter, and scattered among the generations of trees that will fill this forest long after I'm gone. inspired by my wanting to connect with my culture and my roots while in isolation. I'm from the Bronx, I'm from New York, I'm a city girl, and I realized that I had never held a shovel in my life. I did do Girl Scouts, but it honestly was kind of janky. It wasn't real, real Girl Scouts in the Bronx. Like, we really didn't go camping, we kind of cheated on that. So I just realized I hadn't really formed a connection with um, the land at which I had seen my my mom and her aunts like have this beautiful uh, ability to garden and farm and and they grew up in in Jamaica so my family is from Jamaica um, and my grandfather's family actually had migrated from Scotland to Jamaica to be uh, to farm the land and so I come from this kind of long lineage of farmers from Europe to the Caribbean and then I just realized it was like about to end with me. I am, you know, the 41st granddaughter of my grandmother and the only one born in the US and I just kind of like, I realized like, oh my gosh, I'm not passing on my family's uh, love of gardening. I don't know this knowledge and it's going to end with me. 
and I really just wanted to to reconnect with that and and to like just know how to garden and see the process and so I as you saw in the film started this garden with my partner and it wasn't just like a beautiful kind of bonding activity for for he and I but really for me and the elders in my family in particular being able to share videos and stories of my plants and, and produce as they grew every day and seeing my aunt's garden in London as she grew native Jamaican <laughs> vegetables in her in her garden in London it was just it's been such an amazing uh, year during this time of darkness it's really given our family so much light and I could see how much pride um, and happiness it's brought to my family and so to that uh, point I really encourage everyone. Um, I know not everybody has the privilege of maybe knowing where they come from or having a relationship with their biological parents, but if you can find out anything about where you come from, I, I think it's so important to, to just dig deep and really learn about the roots. Uh, there's so much power in the land the land where you come from and in reconnecting with that ability, you might be able to find you know, so much more uh, about yourself in that process. So I really encourage um, everybody, if there are elders that you know that are still alive in your family, reach out to them and talk to them and, and hear their stories. And someone told me once that every time an elder dies, it's like a library being burned down. And I think that something is like that should really stick with us because it's true. Um, our elders carry so much of, of our past and our history and for them to leave this earth without having shared that, um, those roots can, can really, you know, so much can be lost. So much can be lost and um, I'm someone who struggled with identity a lot growing up, being first generation living in the Bronx, going to school in the suburbs in Connecticut, in a very different place um, from where I lived, not knowing who I was, if I was Caribbean or American, uh, if I was black enough you know, for my black friends or Caribbean enough for my family. It was really hard for me and I realize now in this time of having this garden and reconnecting with my family how much at home I truly feel for the first time. Um, it sounds cheesy to say, but it's true. Like I, I feel like myself uh, for the first time. And uh, it's strange, it's a strange feeling, but it's a beautiful feeling. And I, and I wish, you know, I'm 30, 31 now, just turned 31. I wish this was something I had realized sooner, but process, what gardening has also taught me is, is process. Process is so beautiful. I'll like go outside and just stare at my little plant that's just starting to bud a new like little plant. It's so fascinating. To, to see process um, and, and the beauty of process and natural process that gardening brings about. And uh, I've learned so much about myself. Um, so there is really, there really is a strong value in just minimalism and just returning to basics. There's so much beauty in the basics. And I think that we, in this age, this technological age, we can get really blinded by that. And I encourage um, everybody to, if you can, start a small garden, start start with a plant. You don't have to start big. Um, I kind of went a little bit overboard, like, you know, with my garden at first, but, you know, you can start, you can start small and um, you'll be surprised. You might be surprised at what, at what you find. You know, everyone has a phone today. Not everyone's a filmmaker, but really, if you have Instagram or TikTok, you kind of are. So I encourage you to use your phones to capture um, your process, whether it's gardening or conversations with your elders and your family, um, just, you, you know, we are ancestors already. We are ancestors for the generation to come and um, being a good ancestor, documenting where you come from, um, creating your own library to pass on to others is a really cool thing and I think a responsibility uh, that we have as ancestors. So I encourage you if you can, do you document your process, your stories, your family stories, share them with you, share them with each other, take time um, to really spend with your family and your loved ones, 
and um, yeah, that's that's all I have for you today. I hope you guys enjoyed the film. Please share with your family um, and with anyone you know who it might bring some joy. And thank you. And we're here live with Shade to answer some of your questions. Hi, Shade. I loved your short Hi. film. It was so heartwarming. Thank you. Um, I just have a few questions from our audience um, who also loved your film. Um, can we can we ask you from Emily? How can allies be involved in intersectional environmentalism without overstepping on the voices of BIPOC? I think, I mean, the question is just like being sure you're being intersectional um, with your environmentalism, period. Being inclusive, um, being conscious of, of the content that you're sharing and making sure that it's inclusive and making sure there's a space for people of color to feel welcome. I think for me, at least growing up in a very urban environment in a city um, in working class areas where many, um, you know, people of color reside, we don't feel welcome in these spaces or don't often have, you know, spaces to go to farm or to even go outside. And like, I never even like imagined brown bodies like being in nature, like for a long time wasn't a thing. I just literally didn't think that like, that was for me, like farming, I was like, oh, that's a white people thing, you know? So like, I feel like one, um, being sure when you when you speak and any programs you're doing any initiatives make sure that you're you're including um everyone and going into communities um that you don't normally branch into and so it's just about keeping that um consciousness of inclusivity in everything you do for sure and claire asks what are the challenges of bringing the farming practices of your family into a city setting Okay, so I'm in LA right now. So I'm very lucky that my partner had an outdoor area. I understand that not everybody is that lucky. Um, and so I know a lot of people also, you know, living in cities, you can like often get kind of like a small planter, something for your window or your fire escape. Um, so I would recommend you do that if you're living in a city, but for me, the challenges for me, honestly, were just waking up early. Cause you gotta water the, you gotta water your plants either super early in the morning or late at night. Um, and so like, it made me a morning person, which being from the city, I'm usually not, um, and just really allowed me to slow down. Cause being in the city, I'm just so used to being fast paced and like buzzing around from here to there. And um, I don't know if it was a challenge. I mean, maybe, yeah, it was a challenge to kind of just find time to sit still and carve out a time just to be with the plants and to garden and to nurture and not want to just like go do a million other things, even though we're in a pandemic, you know, I'm a city girl, so I'm like still working, I'm still doing all these other things. And so that was definitely a challenge, just slowing down and getting up early and just getting your hands like physically dirty, you know? That's so fun. Yes, your plants can be pets and keep you responsible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we need to go to commercial and that, that's our time for questions. But thank you again, Shade, for your special time and being here with us and connecting live to our community. It means a lot. Um, these discussions are so important, but before we take a short break, we're going to hear from our sustainable brand partners. And when we're back, we're going to have our third and final speaker on our stage, Patty Gonia. So stay tuned. Mother Earth and Father Sky. A Rinda tribe, a journey home. A Rinda tribe, I am from. A Rinda tribe. This is my home. I'm a plant guy. It's only fitting that I have a plant-based phone case that's going to be compostable and end up supporting my plants in my garden one day. <laughs> 
why you should choose a Paleo product because it's literally the best. We can continue to use the products we love without harming the earth. They are 100% compostable. They will break down in the soil, in your compost. It's such an awesome conversation starter with others about plastic pollution. He was helping me take one step towards being more eco-friendly and zero waste. And we're back guys. I'm so excited to introduce you to our last, but certainly not the least speaker of the day, Patagonia, an intersectional environmentalist and drag queen who advocates for inclusivity and diversity in the outdoors. Now out of heels, Wynne Wiley is a 28 year old Nebraska based photographer and together they wear a ton of hats in the social and environmental justice space. So zip up your boots and let's talk coming out of the closet and taking action. Hey everyone, it's Wynne Wiley, pronouns he, him, and also Patagonia, pronouns she, her. Um, today I'll be sharing from both lived experiences um, as Wynne and as Patty. And I really wanted to come here out of drag um, to show you my real life and my day-to-day -day life. Um, I think that drag is so fun and drag is this beautiful art form that I love so much, but I feel like it can also become something that uh, people can also hide behind too and that I can hide behind. And I feel like if we're going to talk about something as vulnerable as allyship and individuality and celebrating our diversity, that it's just really good for me to come to you face to face. But I did bring this to show you. This is a boot that I wear and hike in and uh, recently on a backpacking trip decided to bust open. Um, but these are my boots and my boots symbolize a lot in my life. They symbolize the power of drag. They symbolize the power of the feminine. Um, and most of all, they symbolize the power that I have to put on my boots and to do work um, and to be an ally. And they remind me every day how important it is and how many tools I have to be an ally. And so this talk today is about celebrating our individuality and our diversity. and really using who we are and our uniqueness as the main ingredient and like the secret ingredient to our allyship. Because I don't know about y'all, but unless allyship can feel true to my core and celebrate who I am um, and can use the work that's available to me and only to me, um, I don't know, I don't know if it's going to be as impactful. So today I want to talk about that. And I don't want to bore you, but I want to tell you a little bit about myself and kind of drop you down the rabbit hole of me and my coming out experience both personally as Wynn and my coming out experience as Patty. And then I want to wrap it up with an exercise that I think will really help all of y'all um, as it helps me really navigate uh, the times in my life to figure out how I can make an impact and how I can celebrate who I am um, every day. So here we go. Uh, so uh, I am a Nebraskan. Uh, I'm actually back home right now at my home in Nebraska and I am um, actually sitting blocks away from where I came out to my parents when I was 18 and before that I lived my life in the closet and a closet is nowhere where someone should be and I think that while the coming out experience and being in the closet is true to the queer experience. I think that no matter who we are, we all have closets. And closets are basically denying who we are as a person. They don't allow us to go through the world truly being who we are. They make us hide things. They feel familiar. They feel safe. And I think they're also often um, just on the other side, a really hard conversation or a conversation with yourself or realizing that 
the world doesn't want you to be anything but who you are. And it is so important to not only come out of the closet, but then to think about what's the work I can do and who can I be and how can I put on my boots in my life. So when I came out of the closet at 18, um, I was met with a lot of conditionality. I was met with, uh, we accept you as a queer person, but don't ever do drag. Uh, don't ever be feminine. Don't ever wear bright colors. Uh, don't ever change your voice to be higher. Uh, don't ever transition. Um, and that conditionality and that conditional love really impacted like the next six years of my life. Um, and so I did that. Um, I, I conformed to this life of, okay, I'll be out of the closet and I'll be who I am. Um, but I will uh, be as straight passing as possible. I will be as, um, as blending in as possible. I will be a chameleon instead of being a peacock. And what that did in my life was that made me essentially go back deeper into the closet than I was even in the beginning um, before I was ever out of the closet. Um, it made me change again who I was um, and it really impacted my life. I felt like I was uh, telling myself this story that I was living life as this creative and as a photographer and I was feeling success, but nothing celebrated who I was um, in the work. And I certainly didn't give a shit about the world or about mother nature or about making an impact as an ally. And I told myself that my allyship was, was passive and it was like through the cracks and it was like covert and it was chill. And it was just that I was like accepting everyone. And what that led to was me challenging nothing making no change, making no impact, um, and really truly blending in more than bringing the beautiful person that I was to the picture. Uh, so fast forward to this backpacking trip. Um, I decided to pack these boots, literally like the same exact style of boots, into my pack and to go backpacking for five days in the backcountry. And um, I did it as uh, a sense of freedom. I could be in the outdoors. I could strut through the trails and be who I was um, with the people I loved, recorded a little video, posted it online, and Patty was born. And um, ever since it's been this journey of really figuring out what it means to truly come out of the closet. Because while I think I came out of the closet when I was 18, I feel like I'm just now learning how important it is to not only come out of the closet, but like I said, to put on my boots and to be proud in who I am. And when I'm able to be my unapologetic self, that's nothing but an invitation to invite every other person in my life to be their unapolog unapologetic selves too. And more than that, it lets me do the work that is available to me and only me. It lets me be intersectional in my allyship every single day. And so that brings us to the word intersectional, which I don't want to just throw lightly out there. Um, I think it is such an important word and we need a little history lesson on it. So um, I just want to share that the word intersectionality came from the intersectionality feminist movement and it was birthed out of a lot of incredible black and people of color voices in the feminist space who basically told the story that we are able to make the biggest impact as allies and uh, environmentalists when we are able to tap into who we are. So what does that mean? In my life, that means thinking and realizing that, yes, I can use less plastic in my day-to-day -day life. I have that incredible privilege. Yes, I can care about where I'm spending my dollars, but also what am I able to do as an ally through my queerness? And what I'm able to do as an ally with my queerness is to realize how many tools I have to make impact with. So what that means in my life is realizing I have the art form of drag. I have the art form of photography. I have my voice, not only as a person, but as a queer person. Um, I have my voice as a marginalized person to uplift other marginalized people. I have my ability to make connections and create community and those all feel like tools that I can put in my hand or strap on like my feet to make an impact. And that feels so important. And so my challenge to you is to think about all the ways that you are not only an individual, but all the tools you have and all the privileges you have. And to realize that when you can intersect something that makes you incredibly unique with something you care about so much, 
that like middle ooey gooey good zone is the motherfucking shit and is where it's at and will feel so true to your story and will just feel different to your bones. So let's do a little activity. Um, I want you, if you're able, to either open up your computer um, or open up a little Word document or find a pen and paper. Um, and I want you to think about uh, the following categories with me. Um, so one, what are the privileges you hold? We all have privilege, um, no matter who we are. And so think about your privileges. For me, that means I have straight passing privilege. I have white privilege. I have male privilege. I have economic privilege. Um, for you, that's gonna look really different, but write down your privileges. Um, and I'll get back to privileges in a second. Two, um, I want you to write down your talents. I want you to write down um, your talents and what you love to do and what you have the ability to do. Maybe that means you love to craft. Maybe that means you love to run. Um, maybe that means you love to backpack. Um, so write down the different talents and things you love to do. And then three, I want you to write down pieces about your individuality. Um, maybe you are Latina. Maybe you are queer and disabled. Um, maybe you uh, come from a really interesting space like Nebraska and you have the unique ability to impact people in a space that wouldn't necessarily get impacted. So th I want you to think about your individuality. And if you can write down all those things in these little circles, and you can kind of start to overlap these circles, the final circle I want you to think about is what do you care about? Uh, what matters to you? For me right now, that is getting queer people into the outdoors. That is Black Lives Matter. Um, that is really caring about my environmental impact through a pandemic. So whatever it is that you care about, and when you can intersect these things, I feel like you'll be able to have an impact more than you ever think. For example, maybe you are a runner, like I said, and you are a disabled person, and you also have talent as a photographer. Well, there are so many things you can do through your art form of photography that could serve maybe different nonprofits or organizations. That's work that's available to you and only you. Or maybe that means that you are really interested in uh, like making the best like uh, like pancakes ever and you can really like lift up a company that's doing incredible things for uh, reducing plastic waste um, and using their ingredients in a pancake batter. So these are ridiculous examples but if you can truly think about your intersectionality and what makes you unique and what makes you diverse um, and how that can be the secret ingredient to making it the biggest impact as an ally right now um, or as an environmentalist that's when I feel like your world is gonna change forever. And what I just wanna tell you right now is that it's so worth it to inject who you are um, and to be unapologetic because when you're able to do that in your allyship, that's nothing but leading by example and people will notice and they will start to make an impact too that is perfect to them and will be able to make an impact on this world. So thank you so much. Um, thanks for hearing me talk about intersectionality and uh, just about how we can bring our uniqueness to the table and truly celebrate our diversity and like mean it and like walk the fucking walk, including walking it and whatever heels your heels are. For me, it is these ridiculous high heels, but for you, I don't know what that is for you, but what I can tell you is if you can come out of the closet and be who you are, and then if you can do the work that's available to you and only to you and put on your boots, you can realize how much work we have to do and how fun it's gonna be. So thank you so much. I appreciate it and looking forward to the Q and A. Hi, Patty. <laughs> you look so beautiful. Oh, We're here to answer your questions from the audience. And I'm definitely impressed. Claire mentioned, as a fellow queer, I love you saying your queer experience can give you tools to help any movement you choose to join. Claire also wants to know, how do you hike in those shoes? We are so impressed. It is a struggle. I fall every single day but we get back up and what a perfect metaphor for allyship. Am I right or am I right? <laughs> Amen, completely right. So then how, Maria asked, how did you have the courage to decide to embrace your uniqueness? Hmm. Um, I think I finally let go of people in my life uh, that didn't love me for all of me and that made nothing but room for people that truly loved me. But it wasn't easy. 
Um, it was really hard and it was really scary, but uh, I thought that I was just going to lose people in my life or that I was going to be losing pieces of who I was um, and that that was going to fill with nothing, but that uh, then it gets the idea that if you uh, make room for something, something else is going to show up. So uh, that ended up being people that I could really link arms with um, who really loved me for me and that I can uh, really do some work with. So here we are. That's beautiful. And I wonder, I love how you um, use the tools at hand. And I think that really connected with our audience. So what advice do you give for someone who's a white conservative community in the white conservative community wanting to come out, but thinks that others would treat them differently, which they wouldn't want, but would be unavoidable? Well, wow. well, you're talking to someone who, uh, who grew up um, in white conservative uh, America um, and in a white conservative house. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's kind of like I said in the video, um, it's not gonna be easy, um, but it is so worth it. And a closet is nowhere to be. Um, and I think that might means that you might have to lose some things in life, just like I mentioned before, but I think it's really gonna be worth it. Um, and I think that like you being able to be your unapologetic queer self um, we'll do nothing but, again, let you bring to the table perfectly what you want to bring to the table. Um, and I think there's a lot of us that need to start asking ourselves, who are we and what are we doing? I know in the pandemic, I feel like I had another coming out process where I, I truly felt like, okay, when I can't control so much of what I can control, what can I control? And that felt like a, a new, beautiful coming out of even more honesty with myself as a person, but also about my impact as an environmentalist. Yes, we all truly had our own unique challenges and I love that you're able to share that with us. It's so impactful and powerful. And yet Courtney asks, your story is so compelling. How have you switched your focus to environmental issues? I saw this intersection really interesting as well. So can you share more on that? Yeah, uh, as I started getting more into the passion of drag, I really realized how uh, wasteful of, uh, of an art form it can be. Um, and so I'm really trying to challenge myself to just think outside of the box and to put my ethics and my values out there in my art. So that looks like coming to you in full mother nature fantasy today in a leaf or in a wig made of leaves. Um, here we go, just trying new things out, but I figured why not just try to uh, work uh, my ethics into my art form. I feel like so many of us nowadays um, have so many different art forms we can bring to the table that are so beautiful, whether that is photography or graphic design, or even knowing how to work the internet. Um, I think that's such a creative uh, passion too. And I really feel like um, if we're able to like intersect our environmentalism um, and our ethics with our art forms, that is the start of some really beautiful things in this world. Absolutely. And your costume is amazing, perfect for autumn. Our question is from a lady named Autumn as well. Do you think in order for humanity to embrace the environment, it first has to accept itself? Mm, I read that question as I came in and I was like, my mind is blown that uh, you could synthesize that. I think that that's so beautiful. Um, wow. I really feel like, yeah, the closer we can come to bringing all of ourselves to the spaces we love the most, that's when we can be able to make the biggest impact. And that's when I feel like we'll be even more in touch with, with our world. Because I think that we can, no bullshit, so often forget that it's not like humans and nature, but that we are nature. Um, and that there's no like hierarchy with us on top. We are, we are, all, um, we are all here um, as a part of nature. And I think we have a role to do to really respect and start loving um, all of nature. And for me, that doesn't necessarily look like going out and being number one eco shiro warrior every day. It means what are the daily little things I can do in my life to make a difference? Um, it means getting outdoors and falling in love with nature. And I think my invitation to everyone is just to spend more time outside. Um, it sounds so simple, but I feel like when we can get out into nature, when we can encourage other people to get out into nature and to realize how beautiful it is, we'll know how worth it it is to fight for. And I guess in there, you have some final tips for us for being an ally? Um, sure. Final tips for being an ally. I mean, like, I love to do it with friends. I think that every single 
time I felt like I've made the biggest impact as an ally, it's been in community. Um, it's been through learning, it's been through conversation. Um, so I would just say um, it's so important now more than ever to to make your allyship uh, community based as well, because I think there's a lot of people that need encouraging. And I think there's a lot of times that we need encouragement as well and need support. So I'd say do it with community, um, make it positive and make it entertaining. Um, let's be real. So much of the environmental space is so doom and gloom. And I think we don't need to forget that, but we need to say, okay, what does it look like to rethink this through the lenses of education through entertainment or being able to just make it a positive, fun community time for us to come together? There's not a single climate rally that I've been to where there isn't a giant amount of food that people bring from like all their different cultures or from like all their different favorite foods and we'll bring it in. We just eat this food together. And that feels like such a beautiful way to come together and just to literally uh, share a meal, share food, share community, and then to go out and do some work. So those are my tips. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really beautiful way of looking at it to make sure that you're, you know, practicing environmentalism each and every day, not just on the wheel one day and off it the next, but really incorporating mm -hmm. it into your community, into your surroundings and making sure that it's a proactive, positive engagement. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Patty, again for joining us. And unfortunately, that's all our time for questions. But thank you again so much for being here with us today and to all our speakers. I personally learned a ton. So where do we go from here? Now, if you're one of our top tier ambassadors, we'll see you tomorrow for a private roundtable discussion. But if not, that's OK, too. We appreciate you attending. And thank you for being part of Project Human Nature. Now, we just posted a photo on the Pila Case Instagram, so do check it out and let us know what this event means to you. Of course, you can follow our speakers, Shie Bastida, Shade Clacken Joseph, and as well as Patagonia, where you can find not just inspirational content from Patty. I remember seeing a very powerful image of you in drag in nature. Um, and we can also check out your film there as well. Um, and Shade, we can also see her film Home there on her Instagram. And also she has her talks such as her TED Talks there on her Instagram. Lastly, keep your eyes on our inbox, on your inbox that is. We'll be announcing our seven prize winners later on today. So you can look forward to receiving something from us as a little gift. That's it folks. My name is Liblo Golding and I hope to meet you all in person one day. Until then, very much love from our Pila fam and for everyone here. Bye-bye. See y'all later.